Fishermen in Virginia Beach spot a dark suitcase bobbing in the waters of Chesapeake Bay. When it was opened, it contained two legs of a white male. Six days later, and just a mile away, another suitcase. Inside, more gruesome remains. Wrapped within five garbage bags was a human torso that was cut at approximately the belt line. It was severed from the waist down, had both his right and left arms that were folded across him, and, he, and his head was still attached. Finally, at a nearby marina, a third suitcase. Inside that suitcase, again, was the black trash bags, along with the midsection. The dismembered body parts are rotting and falling apart. I have never, ever seen anything like this. This is an individual that's died a horrible death and has been discarded like a piece of trash. It's a brutal murder that turns into a game of cat and mouse with a devious and determined killer. Virginia Beach police officers carefully inspect the three suitcases found near the Chesapeake Bay Bridge Tunnel. Once we found all three suitcases in the same area, it was pretty evident that somebody had stopped on the bridge and tossed them over the side of the bridge. The three suitcases were all green and black matching suitcases. Um, the first one that had the legs in there was a 24-inch um, carry-on. The one with the torso was a 30-inch, and the one with the midsection was a 26-inch. The remains are sent to the medical examiner's office in Norfolk, Virginia. The human remains, they were of a white male. The legs themselves were in remarkably good condition. In a much greater stage of decomposition was the torso. Some of the flesh started to rot away, the midsection. It was about ready to fall apart. CSI Dutton is able to pull a set of fingerprints from the corpse. The first goal was actually to try to identify whose remains these are through DNA, through any sort of fingerprint, data bank. If I can't identify him through forensics, the investigators can't really go forward with their investigation. Dutton orders an autopsy and runs the prints through the law enforcement computer data bank. There's no match. Investigators comb the luggage and the remains for other clues. The suitcases were pretty much bereft of any blood evidence supporting that he likely really bled out before he went into the suitcases. The first thing that it registered was this guy was dead prior to being cut up. The autopsy results show multiple gunshot wounds to the torso. There was one gunshot wound into his back one in his head that went to the back of the head, out through his uh, forehead, and then one lower in his stomach just below that cut line. Two bullets were recovered, later identified as a 38 caliber. Inside one of the suitcases, a valuable clue. Wrapped around the head, torso area of this male was a, uh, an off-white blanket that was recovered during examination of the contents. I read the tag on it and I did a quick internet search and discovered that it was from a hospital supply company. But the water-soaked trash bags that contain the remains yield nothing. The bags themselves had a thick, slimy, decayed skin film all over, both on the outside and the inside of the bags, which made it extremely difficult to process for any sort of trace analysis. The victim's DNA is entered into state and national criminal data banks. When there are no matches, investigators use the recovered head to create a sketch. So what they did was, I think about a week after the last suitcase was found, they actually released a composite sketch, a sort of a round, kind of bloated face of a sketch that they drew from, obviously, from the head they'd found. As soon as it's released, they get a call. We got a phone call from John and Susan Rice, 
that reside in Chesapeake, Virginia. They had offered information that they had a friend, and they felt that the sketch resembled their friend, William McGuire. They hadn't heard from him in a couple weeks. We knew that Bill was missing. I mean, we got a phone call from Bill's sister uh, three weeks prior to the sketch coming out. The Rices hesitantly agree to look at photos of the victim's remains. That was really hard. Um, I was pretty certain that it was Bill. There was skin slippage, but there were certain characteristics on that face that yeah, I just knew that it was Bill. Meanwhile, the results of the fingerprint analysis come in. The fingerprints were checked, and sure enough, it, it did turn out to be Bill McGuire. Uh, Bill was um, a good a good friend. He'd be there for me. He had uh, a really good sense of humor, um, a lot of fun to, to be around. He was 39 years old. He had a lot of friends that cared about him, and he was very, very, very much in love with his two children and his wife. He was a great dad. He was always concerned about the boys. Um, loving, playful. Detective Ray Pickell contacts William's wife, Melanie, a nurse at a fertility clinic in Morristown, New Jersey. And the Virginia Beach Police clearly said at that time that they had no motive and that they had no suspects. But what we learned right after news broke of William McGuire being identified was that his wife did not file a missing persons report. Melanie McGuire immediately emerged as someone who the authorities wanted to talk to. So I received a phone call from Melanie McGuire saying that she could meet with me at her attorney's office. Unusual in a case like this. You don't normally get an attorney involved unless you're being accused of something. Melanie reveals that her marriage to William had recently been strained. They had closed on a new home on April 28th of 2004. They didn't celebrate after the closing of their house. They had gone to bed, but then they woke up early in the morning between 2 and 4 a.m. and immediately started arguing about the new house and the children. She asserted that he had stuffed a dryer sheet into her mouth and left claiming that uh, she was the reason the kids would never see their father again. And she said that was the last time she saw him. That same day, Melanie McGuire filed for a restraining order against her husband. A month later, the day before she was notified of William's murder, she moved out of the house and filed a petition for divorce. It was a pretty damning document. Uh, she alleged uh, verbal abuse, physical abuse, both to her and to their two small children. The part that did surprise me was the fact that Bill would even do something like that. He was the type of person that would not stand by and let a woman get attacked, much less do the attacking. He just, that was not in him. He was not a, he was not a physically violent person anyway. In those divorce papers, she said that William McGuire had gambling problems and was seriously in debt and that he was also behaving erratically as though someone were after him. Melanie hints that her husband's gambling may have put him in contact with some shady characters. She suggests the police look for his car in Atlantic City. But she did also mention that he was a heavy gambler and he was well comped at a lot of the Atlantic City uh, casinos. As detectives listen to Melanie's story, they ask her if she owns a matching set of luggage. And she said she didn't. Uh, she nor her husband owned any uh, matching set of luggage. They just owned mixed pieces. As the meeting ends, Detective Pickell is struck by Melanie's cold indifference to her husband's murder. She had all the facial expressions of being concerned and trying to cry, and she just couldn't cry. You know, she couldn't force herself to cry. There were no tears. There, you know, her eyes didn't even get watery. Suspicious of Melanie's behavior, investigators launched a search of the McGuire's now vacant apartment. Well, the apartment is the last place that we were aware of that he was seen alive, and that was by Melanie McGuire. 
When Virginia Beach and the Woodbridge Police Department went in, it was before the management had gone in to do anything, and um, they found nothing. Not a hair, no blood, no saliva. So I thought that was very significant um, because it showed that there was a great amount of effort done to clean what was left behind. You could have ate off the floor. This apartment was so clean that it almost looked brand new inside. Investigators consider their evidence. The dismembered body of William McGuire wrapped in trash bags. A matching set of three suitcases. A white medical supply blanket. Two 38 caliber bullets. Divorce papers from his wife. And an alleged gambling habit. We knew that Bill liked to gamble, but it was not excessive. He just thought it was fun. Though Melanie McGuire remains a prime suspect, investigators could not tie her to any of the evidence. This was probably one of the most high-pressure cases we had all worked. It's coming right on the heels of a holiday weekend. Virginia Beach is a tourist town, so absolutely, the pressure was tremendous to identify this guy, solve this, and do it as quickly as possible. Was it the wife? Was Bill McGuire in over his head at the casinos? Or was there someone or something else investigators had missed? In the days after Bill McGuire's grisly murder, his friends and neighbors struggled to make sense of the crime. When the public learned that William McGuire was just a, a regular New Jersey guy, the shock grew. William McGuire was a computer troubleshooter, and he was the father of two young boys. When it was discovered that he was found in matching luggage, it added an element of mystery to this case that the public was not going to let go of until this crime was solved. And at this part, it was hard to separate fact from speculation. And we had to be very careful in what we reported. But the details were, were too tantalizing, and, and people filled it in. The prime suspect in the case is the victim's wife, Melanie. The couple had been married for five years. Uh, they seemed to be a really good couple. They were real quick-witted. They would, um, you know, joke around, arguably, and... You know, she wouldn't take any stuff from him. We thought she was a perfect fit for Bill. If Bill said something, she would have a comeback or vice versa. We just thought they were such a fun couple to be around. To the McGuire's friends, Melanie's statement that Bill was violent and suddenly walked out doesn't make any sense. To pack a bag over an argument, over what? You know, to walk out the door just didn't sound like Bill. Melanie's indifferent attitude about Bill's murder is also baffling. Melanie never wanted to know who could have done something like this. That was never a question for her, and we didn't understand that. She just accepted it, and when she was asked, you know, why don't you want to find out who the killer is? Well, I can't think about that right now. When detectives asked to see Bill's personal belongings, Melanie says she has already given them away to a complete stranger. She had packed Bill's clothing in big garbage bags and gave them to one of the young men that helped her move. And he took them home, and lucky for us, he had not gotten rid of them. So we had these bags that we know came from the apartment. The trash bags are an important lead, if they can be matched to the ones William's body was wrapped in. Knowing that we do have the capabilities of matching lot numbers with the trash bags, you can tell what bag and what lot came from, from what piece of machinery. The trash bags are forwarded to Texas, where a leading supplier of commercial plastic bags conducts extensive analysis. But it will take weeks to get the results. Then, a strange twist in the case. Melanie changes her story about the luggage. In fact, she said, they did own a matching set of luggage. Uh, it was a greenish black color luggage, and it was a name brand luggage. Detective Pickell showed her a photograph of the exterior of the suitcases that were found in Virginia, and she said that she thought that they could be hers. I think she had enough time to think, what if 
something of, of mine is in one of the suitcases, like a hair or something. And just one month after the first suitcase was found, another lead. William's car is located at a casino in Atlantic City. It was parked at a hotel and it was picked up during a routine search of the parking lot by a uh, contracted tow service. That automatically raised suspicions about his interests in gambling, which were buttressed by the divorce complaint that talked about his gambling debts. Investigators check with the casinos. They quickly learn McGuire had no large gambling debts. He was in Atlantic City about 30 times over five years. His gambling records indicated that he was an overall winner. He actually was ahead, not in debt. And there was no indication that what he was doing was anything other than enjoy legal gambling. Investigators are beginning to wonder, were Melanie's tales of gambling and her divorce petition all part of an elaborate cover-up? I really think she was doing her best to set up an alibi. Meanwhile, McGuire's car is taken to the lab and combed for evidence. In the glove compartment was a vial of a pink liquid, and it wasn't labeled, and we didn't know what it was. It was alongside a hypodermic syringe without the needle. The floor mats and carpets are vacuumed for microscopic particles. Inside the vacuumings were tiny bits of torn flesh. And this level of depth in the skin is not the type that would normally be naturally shed from a human being. The evidence is critically important. Police now know that McGuire's body must have been transported in the car. They check the security camera in the hotel parking lot. There is actually a surveillance tape of the vehicle being parked at 12.40 a.m. You can see the vehicle parking in its uh, parking spot. However, because the video was poor quality, we could not tell who was actually operating the car when it pulled in. Where McGuire was killed, not where his body was found, determines who will prosecute the case. You know, he was last seen there in New Jersey. His car is found in New Jersey. In late 2004, Virginia Beach police hand off the case to New Jersey State Police. Although McGuire was dismembered, investigators make finding the actual murder weapon their top priority. We have a, a crime with a, with a firearm. Let's find the firearm. That was a focus early on. New Jersey gun registries are checked against the McGuire circle of friends and family. There are no hits. Investigators look elsewhere. It's very simple to obtain a, a, a weapon in the state of Pennsylvania. In fact, you simply have to have a basically clean record and a Pennsylvania driver's license. Then, pay dirt. Bingo, three days before the murder, Melanie McGuire went to Pennsylvania to get a 38 caliber Taurus handgun. It's the same caliber weapon that killed Bill McGuire. April 26th. At approximately 3.10 p.m. Eastern Time, Melanie McGuire appeared at a very small gun shop in a remote location in Easton, Pennsylvania, and purchased a handgun. We obtained the ATF and the Pennsylvania documents that Melanie McGuire fraudulently filled out. Uh, Melanie McGuire listed that she had lived in East Stroudsburg, Pennsylvania, rather than in Woodbridge, New Jersey, where we knew she lived. I don't think I ever investigated a murder that had this level of detail and planning. A tap is placed on Melanie's phone conversations, and it immediately pays off. Melanie was having a secret affair with a doctor named Bradley Miller. Dr. Miller uh, was one of her co-workers. And very importantly, he was somebody that she confided in. When detectives confront Dr. Miller, he admits to the affair, and he agrees to cooperate with the investigation. Detectives record a conversation between Dr. Miller and Melanie, and he asks about the gun she bought in Pennsylvania. But you don't know where it is. No, I don't know where it is. Because the best thing to do is to turn it over for him and let them, you know, 
mean, there's got to be some way to show that you are not. Well, they basically don't want to seem to hear any of that. As the conversation ends, Dr. Miller asks Melanie point blank, did she kill her husband? You swear you didn't have to do it. Yes. And your children's lives. Because I'm standing by you. Yes. But Melanie does admit something else to Miller. She tells him she was in Atlantic City the night William's car was left there. Melanie McGuire told Dr. Miller that on the evening of April 29th, she decided to drive to Atlantic City and attempt to find her husband. It becomes an increasingly strange tale. What she said was that after she drove down to Atlantic City, she was too tired to drive home. So she took a cab from Atlantic City to Woodbridge, New Jersey, which is about a hundred mile drive. Went to sleep, got some rest, took a cab back to Atlantic City, got her car from there and went home. The story makes little sense. Police believe it's an elaborate fiction designed to cover Melanie in case someone saw her in Atlantic City. The truth, according to detectives, is that Melanie drove William's car to Atlantic City, ditched it, and caught a cab home. Ten months after William McGuire's body surfaced in Chesapeake Bay, detectives focus on their prime suspect, the victim's wife, Melanie McGuire. Dr. Miller learns a remarkable fact about Melanie's whereabouts weeks later on May the 4th, the day before the first suitcase was recovered. On the morning of the 4th, she went furniture shopping in Delaware. What was going on then? You know, according to her story, if you were to believe it, her husband, you know, they closed on a $500,000 house. Her husband got violent for the first time and left. She got a restraining order. She had to clear out of her apartment. And that's when she decides to go to Delaware to go furniture shopping. Why Delaware? Investigators believe it's another attempt by Melanie to create a cover story. Delaware is en route to Virginia, where investigators believe Melanie was headed to dump her husband's body off a bridge. And why had she chosen that particular bridge? The Chesapeake Bay Bridge and Tunnel is very straight in places. And that's significant because someone standing on the bridge at night when it's dark would be able to see headlights coming from more than a mile away. It would give one time to stop the car and get three suitcases out of the trunk without being spotted. But could someone Melanie's size wrestle the suitcases over the railing? Remember, the suitcases were on wheels. By the railing on the bridge, there's a nine inch curb, which if you pull the suitcase up onto the curb, now it's by the handrail on the bridge. And the distance is only 31 inches from the top of the curb to the top of the handrail. The top of the handrail could have been used as a lever. Um, and the other suitcases were smaller and shouldn't have been a problem at all. The information obtained in Dr. Miller's phone call with Melanie is invaluable. Police convince another of Melanie's friends, Jim Finn, to speak with her. That conversation is also recorded. Is there anything else you're not telling me? Can you blame me? I think having an affair is a little bit different than murder. I think you're lying. Excuse me? I am sorry, but I think you're lying to me. Your voice just got real low. Because I'm in my office. I'll do anything for you. Jim. Help me. Jim, I need it. The gun also comes up in this conversation. Yeah. Tell me about it. 
about it. How do you want me to I don't know. Give me some information. You didn't go with me to buy it. You didn't help me buy it. You didn't talk to me about it. I didn't tell you that I bought it. Why not? Well, what? hey, why not? Why not? Because I was told not to. Again, gee, I wonder why. Weren't well, you happy or not knowing? Hey, hold on. Told, well, told by who? Your lawyer. Well, when did you start seeing a lawyer? I started seeing a lawyer before I knew my husband was even dead when I filed for divorce. The incriminating evidence seems to be piling up, but investigators still have to wait for test results, including the black trash bags found with the body and in the McGuire's house, the bits of flesh found in William McGuire's car, and the medical blanket wrapped around the body. We're, we're getting evidence, and the evidence leads you to the truth. Hopefully it leads to who is responsible for the death of a human being. Every single thing that came in was looked at, is there anything else we have to cover? It was never, oh, we're not going that way because we know it's her. Um, we had to eliminate every other possibility. It's not like television where results are obtained the next day. We have to normally wait weeks, months to get the results, but that's police work. The first test results to come back involve the black trash bags. Experts compare the bags used to dispose of the body with the ones Melanie used to dispose of her husband's clothes. They were comprised of the same polymers, uh, low density recycled polyethylene, and they were manufactured on the same extruder. So you could see that the bags that held the body and the bags that held the belongings were almost sequential. It ended up being really formidable evidence. Next came the analysis of the bits of flesh found on the floor of William's car. Those tiny pieces of flesh turned out to belong to Bill McGuire. The person may have washed her hands, but she didn't think to change her shoes. And these small pieces of flesh, when they made contact with the carpet in the car, were transferred. By her own admission, Melanie was in her husband's car the day he disappeared. My conclusion was that the person who transferred them to the rug of the car was in the room when Bill McGuire was cut up. Then the medical blanket wrapped around William's torso is linked to a manufacturer used by Melanie's office. That's a key piece. Once I found out that she was a nurse, the pieces started to, uh, to fall into place for me. What was interesting about the dismemberment of Bill McGuire is how neatly it was done. His legs were dismembered through joints. They didn't cut through bones. They cut through the tendons and the muscles and disconnected his knees from his thighs. The big cut through his midsection, again, was extremely neat. It's clear to investigators that whoever dismembered William McGuire had medical training and Dr. Miller had been ruled out as a suspect. There was no evidence that led to Dr. Miller. And Dr. Miller uh, did cooperate with the state. That left only Melanie, who was trained as a nurse. Somebody had to have some sort of knowledge on the human body. And I think it directly points to Melanie McGuire. On June 2nd, 2005, nearly 13 months after the first suitcase was discovered, Melanie McGuire is arrested and charged with first-degree murder in her husband's death. She pleads not guilty. Public was stunned by this. Here you had a woman who was a respected fertility nurse. She was the mother of two, and here she is charged with shooting and dismembering her husband, stuffing his body into three suitcases, and then hurling them off a bridge in Virginia. Once uh, Melanie was arrested by the New Jersey authorities, it was a sense of relief. It was like, finally, you know, she's been arrested for what she has done. Yeah, she needed to be prosecuted. But the case is far from a slam dunk. 
there was an enormous amount of circumstantial evidence, but it didn't directly link her to the murder of her husband. The saw she used to dismember the body and the murder weapon itself, the gun, are still missing. The fact that they didn't find that gun meant that they could not link the bullets found with William McGuire's remains to a specific weapon that they could have done through ballistic testing. The gun was gotten rid of. I don't know where it is, whether it's somewhere at the bottom of the Chesapeake Bay. It's no surprise that the saw is gone. Prosecutors argue that the absence of evidence shows how carefully Melanie planned the crime. In a case like this with somebody who was planning so meticulously the entire murder, it would have been contrary if we had had the gun and the saw. Even after Melanie's arrest, the search for evidence doesn't stop. Detectives believe access to her computer will turn up more information, and they're not disappointed. And what they found is someone did a Google search with the words, how to commit a murder. If anything in this case presented the compelling argument that Melanie McGuire was premeditating the killing of her husband, it was that. And there are more incriminating web searches. They were in the vein of um, undetectable poisons, how to purchase a handgun in Pennsylvania specifically. And on the same day that Melanie bought the gun, she ran a web search on a powerful sedative called chloral hydrate. In old movies, you heard about Mickey fins or someone getting slipped a Mickey. A Mickey is a uh, Mickey Finn is a mixture of alcohol with chloral hydrate. The combination of the two can make a person pass out very quickly. We always felt, how did she get control of him? If it happened in the apartment, why didn't he fight? So in talking about it, gee, maybe he was incapacitated. And the chloral hydrate just made perfect sense. Then a huge break in the case. We later found that at a Walgreens drugstore located within a mile and a half of the daycare center where the McGuire children attended a prescription from the workplace of Melanie McGuire was filled for the drug chloral hydrate it was purportedly signed by Dr. Bradley Miller it was prescribed to a patient of the medical facility where Dr. Miller and Mrs. McGuire worked Dr. Miller's signature on the prescription is a forgery. We know that Melanie McGuire had access to availability of the prescription pad, as all nurses did there. At that point in time, we were still attempting to identify what that pinkish liquid was that was found in the glove box of the victim's maxima. That liquid was, in fact, chloral hydrate. And now we had more evidential linkage. Investigators now believe they know exactly what happened. On April 28th, Melanie purchased the chloral hydrate at a drugstore near her children's daycare. Later that day, the McGuire's returned home after buying a new house. What do most people do after they close on a house? They celebrate. And Bill had an affinity for red wine. He uh, collected red wine. And, you know, what could go into red wine that wouldn't be seen but a liquid? I believe that they were celebrating and that he ingested chloral hydrate. I think he was rendered incapacitated. Even though William's body tested negative for chloral hydrate, that doesn't dissuade prosecutors. Chloral hydrate is it's very quickly metabolized and it is very hard to detect. The body parts were exposed to the elements, so no, we were not able to, to definitely say that there was chloral hydrate that was in the body, but the toxicologist couldn't say that there wasn't chloral hydrate in the body. Also undetermined, exactly how much time passed between William's shooting 
and the dismemberment of his body. In all likelihood, she removed the children from the house the next day before she killed him and then uh, went about cutting him up. And I don't think it was done fast. I think that he was cut up in the shower stall in the master bathroom. I think it was set up so she could clean up easily. I believe that his lower legs were taken off first and that he was allowed to more or less bleed out as much as gravity would allow because it decreased the mess. And eventually the body parts were put into the garbage bags. The garbage bags were put into the suitcases and the suitcases allowed her to move the body parts to the car without attracting attention and with relative ease. I think then on the night of May 3rd into May 4th, she drove down to the Chesapeake Bay Bridge where the suitcases were thrown off the bridge and tunnel into the water. It's a simple story, but it's a complicated case. Will a jury buy it? This case was sprawling. The volume of it, the complexity of it, was more than in any other case I've ever worked. And now we're trying to bring this probably, I don't know, year, year and a half investigation, you know, package it up so people could understand it. So it was a daunting, daunting task. It will be a courtroom battle between a determined prosecutor and an intelligent and beautiful defendant whose image is anything but that of a vicious murderer. Investigators have finally gathered the evidence they need to arrest Melanie McGuire for the murder of her husband. Now, they have to convince the jury. There was a lot of work and effort by a lot of people to get the case to this point, and, um, you know, you try to do the right thing. Everybody, I think, wants justice to be done. On March 5th, 2007, Melanie McGuire entered the courtroom, charged with killing and dismembering her husband. I do believe she, she was in love with Dr. Miller. I think she knew how desperately uh, Bill loved his children and the prospect of a divorce would not have been easy for her. So I think uh, she just needed Bill to be gone. The state police said this is a tale of lies, deceit, infidelity, and murder. Right there, it spells out all the details that are compelling to the public in a murder case. You had major networks covering the trial. I had never been in a courtroom with this much media coverage. I knew everybody was, was watching. People's uh, reputations are affected by what they do publicly. The first challenge for the prosecution is combating the defendant's good looks and positive public image. In person, she really is physically beautiful. And uh, I think many people, when they think of a murder, particularly one with a cut-up body, thinks that it would be a monster that would have to do this. And she does not look like a monster. But the evidence is on the prosecution side. The, the point remains, she bought a handgun. She moved the vehicle. There were plastic bags found with McGuire's body and those linked to the apartment, certainly the Google hits, how to commit a murder. I mean, why would someone other than Melanie McGuire be doing that in their home? The defense counters with its own strategy. A lot of the facts in the case were clouded very effectively by the defense. The chloral hydrate, William McGuire had been a pharmacy student at one time defense co-counsel suggesting that, you know, uh, Atlantic City loan sharks were involved in the murder of William McGuire. He said, when you get into debt and you can't make the payments, what happens to you? You get shot here and you get shot here. William's friends tell a different story. They say the defense is painting an unfair picture of the victim. I was there to tell more about how he was as a father, um, more about his character. Actually show that this person was, you know, had friends, was not a, some animal that was attacking his wife, gambling, 
and all the all the other things because they they kept they kept bringing out all the junk on him, which a lot of it was made up anyway. Melanie does not testify. By all accounts, she appears calm inside the courtroom and during breaks in the trial. She was always dressed beautifully. She always looked lovely. She was always chatting at the breaks with the reporters and with the media and with friends that she had in the courtroom. The thing that stuck with me is when I was showing photographs, she would actually look at these are the suitcases. This is your husband's legs here. Most times the defendants will look down, um, will look away. My first reaction is, well, I guess you don't have to divert your eyes. You've seen this before. After six weeks of testimony, both the prosecution and the defense are done presenting their cases. It was uh, 83 witnesses in total that were called in less than six weeks of testimony. Most of those witnesses were called by the state. Then there were videotapes, there were audio tapes from the wire, there was pieces of physical evidence, what was taken from uh, the suitcases, there were forensic reports. It was huge. The case is now in the hands of the jury. The jury was out three days and deliberated for about 14 hours over the course of those three days. McGuire spoke to us and she was very confident very cocky almost, you know? And she gave the impression of, of someone who was just confident that she was gonna beat this rap. On April 23rd, the jury delivers its verdict. Melanie McGuire is found guilty of murdering her husband. When the verdict came down, she was utterly and instantly horrified at what happened. It seemed like whatever delusions that she had about this case, regardless of her guilt or innocence, had suddenly completely collapsed on her. The verdict in this case confirmed a pretty dark view of what people were capable of. I mean, you could be compassionate and caring and at the same time be incredibly diabolical. And that was the truly chilling thing about this case. There was just overwhelming circumstantial evidence in this case. You know, I, I'm, I really think the right thing was done. And uh, I was really proud to be a part of it. I felt that all our work was, you know, uh, for a true purpose, that truth did in fact prevail in this. In July 2007, Melanie McGuire is sentenced to life in prison. In New Jersey, what that means essentially is about 66 years of incarceration. And what that meant for Melanie McGuire was that she was going to be put away until she was about 102 years old, if I recall. In September 2008, Melanie McGuire's appeal was administratively dismissed because she failed to file the proper paperwork by the deadline. The verdict was very memorable. I think she deserved it. You know, she took uh, the father of those two children away from those, you know, kids. So she deserved life. There's no doubt. But it's a hollow victory for William's friends. My wife and I, you know, we thought we'd, we'd jump up and cheer, you know, when he, he gave her life. But justice would have been me getting my friend back.